of course, is an associate research fellow at the Institute of Sociology at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Uh, previously, he was also a senior lecturer in the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Paris Hydro, and a former director himself of the CFC Taiwan, uh, CFC Taipei, uh, no. uh, where, where we are uh, right now. Uh, so he recently co-edited a book with uh, Ho Ming Xiu and me, uh, Michael Xiao, Environmental uh, Movements and Politics of the Asian Anthropocene. Uh, he also wrote a, a chapter in this book uh, called Environmental Movement in Taiwan's Anthropocene, a Civic Eco-Nationalism. Uh, so today, Paul will present uh, a lecture based, I think, on this chapter uh, called uh, Taiwan in the Anthropocene. Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Paul uh, with us uh, today. So please uh, welcome Paul uh, for, for this lecture. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nathanael. It's, uh, it's always very good to, to be back at CFC. I feel almost at, at home here. And, um, and especially in this room, long time, you know, I always enjoy your seminar here. And uh, yes, and uh, welcome everyone. We used to speak in French from in, in the old days and, uh, and, and we had the, many people but for some reason now we change to english so i, I try my best to uh, uh with my french accent hope uh, everyone can understand please please don't hesitate if you don't understand what i say just i that's the advantage of having some, a few people in the room not not everything online so please don't hesitate to interrupt me so uh um mais en ligne, ils voient ce qui est sur l'écran. Ok, d'accord. Uh, so, um, as uh, um, Nathaniel Kenley introduced me, uh, um, this is a book. Ah, comment tu fais Voilà, tu, tu appuies où Ici. Ah, d'accord. Okay. So, it is a book, uh, we, a collective book I recently uh, published with my colleagues. Um, Hui Mingxiu from National Taiwan University and uh, um, uh, Xinhua Michael Xiao, my colleague at uh, the Institute of Sociology. Donc, je peux mon masque, moi. So I have, I have the privilege, I can do, I can take off my mask, so it's easier to speak. Um, and, um, and 10 other colleagues from uh, mostly Southeast Asia, Hong Kong and, and uh, a, a dozen of uh, uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have a uh, case study uh, from the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, and uh, Singapore, and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the geopolit geographic center of this book is, is uh, somewhere in the South China Sea. Uh, these are the chapters. So I, I, I will not speak uh, the whole book. Today I would like to focus on the case of Taiwan. I will uh, briefly give you a, 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 an overall panorama of the, of the book, and I will discuss more about the content of uh, what I put in the what I wrote in the chapter about Taiwan, and use this as a pretext for I would like to end my presentation. Um, by two points, uh, the geopolitical aspect of this, uh, what I tried to, to, to do in this chapter and how it can, uh, can be uh, developed further for uh, other studies. And also how it echoes uh, the coming referendum in December. And uh, I'm sure some of you would have uh, some comments that uh, would be helpful for all of us. Uh, the notion of Anthropocene, uh, was introduced 20 years ago in the scientific literature by a Nobel Prize, a chemist Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, since then it has been uh, helpful and instrumental to uh, increase the awareness on all kinds of environmental issues, uh, including uh, the, the, the global warming and uh, also the um, sharp decrease uh, of biodiversity. Some people talk of the sixth mass 
extinction. Uh, so this uh, give you an idea of the level of of the of the global. I was about to say crisis, but actually the the merit of this word Anthropocene is just to remind us this is not just a crisis because in the Greek crisis crisis in Greek uh, it give you the idea that you will have a, a return back to the normal situation once it's over. But I think it becomes quite clear now with uh, what we, we, we experience now with COVID-19 and other environmental crises that uh, they are not crises. <laughs> they are something more than that. And uh, this is what is con con included in the notion of Anthropocene is that we have reached such a, a, an alarming state of the environment, this is the world, the, the world we live in, the, the ecosphere we live in, um, that uh, it has uh, its uh, level of the geology. The Anthropocene it refers to the Holocene, which uh, are uh, geological uh, categories decided by geologists and uh, specialists of the of the earth sciences. Um, but in Asia, the, the, the now we have a, a huge literature, mostly in English, French, some Western languages, but very, very few in Asian languages. I've done some research for Chinese and Japanese and um, and I asked my colleagues from Southeast Asia to provide what they could about uh, what they could find in, in, in Southeast Asian languages. I had some feedback from Indonesia, but uh, yeah, very, very little. So it's basically, it remains so far as a Western notion. and. Uh, and uh, but there there are some burgeoning uh, discussions, especially here in Taiwan with some colleagues. Uh, that's a very limited to uh, um, small, uh, very little academic cycles uh, in discussion with artists or ecologists uh, engaging in various uh, environmental issues. So basically, we have a, a, an Asian notion. So why talking of Asian Anthropocene? Well, it's a provocation. It's a, there is, Anthropocene is global, so you, it's, it means nothing to, to say the Western Anthropocene or the Asian Anthropocene. This is a, a, a play on words to attract, uh, uh, to bring the attention on, on why uh, it is important to, uh, although it is a global issue, why it is important to think from different regional perspective. Uh, in other words, what is in the impact of the Anthropocene in Asia, or what is the impact of Asia in, on the, in this Anthropocene literature? Um, to give you a rough idea, uh, it's, uh, if we just we focus on the issue of global warming from 1998 to 2017, five of the top 10 countries most affected by climate change were in Asia. Myanmar, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Um, um, Jakarta has been introduced as the city of the Anthropocene because it's 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 uh, it's um, threatened by its uh, sea rise to such an extent that the, the government has decided to uh, move the capital city uh, to uh, Borneo. Inversely, the Asia Pacific region as a whole is the highest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere, with 40% 40 40 of global emissions in 2015. So I guess it's more now. And this percentage is projected to increase until 2013, yeah, with uh, around 90% uh, for the, of, and 90% of the Asia Pacific contribution come from mostly China, India, and Indonesia. Uh, China and India for the use of coal, Indonesia because forests are burning basically, or transform into palm, palm oil uh, agribusiness. So, uh, ta Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea are, in comparison to China and in India, the, 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 their um, carbon footprint is, is lim rather limited, but yet uh, those three countries, in terms of Proportionally to their population, uh, they rank at the bottom of the countries that are most in duty to reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, they, they, they are not uh, good. Uh, they don't show the good example so far. Now, if we take the other issue that um, even uh, even most uh, uh, 
topic of concern is the biodiversity loss. So Asia is the world's third largest, largest zone of tropical forest and a concomitant repository of terrestrial biodiversity. But the pace of deforestation drives a mass destruction. This biodiversity loss, oceans depletion of fish and corals, the rivers, flora and fauna, does not only result from global warming, but from agribusiness. Think about pesticides and a massive program of hydroelectric dams construction. So this is to remind that we, we put too much things in global warming. And uh, we should remind that there are other um, additional effects to global warming. I mean, agribusiness is contrib contributing to global warming, but it's, it's also an additional um, mass killer of biodiversity in that sense. Now, uh, the specificity of this book, uh, we do include a lot of uh, research from scientists on, on, on the global warming and biodiversity loss, but uh, the, specific, the specificity of this book is put on what can social movements do about this? Uh, and most of the time, given the, if you have seen the last report from IPCC, we feel depressed. Um, a recent survey published in Lancet has shown that uh, young people in Europe, mostly in Europe, but this is a, I think it's also the case in, in the Philippines and countries like Philippines, Indonesia, young people feel, feel, feel depressed about all this. And you can understand maybe uh, when you're just 15 years old, basically the, the great atom generation, you know, we can understand their feeling about all this, that their generation of their parents and it seems they are, we are uh, totally uh, lacking our responsibility uh, to address seriously uh, what is at stake now. So uh, the idea with this book is, uh, um, including young people, how social movements can address these issues in a way, well, could be like Greta Thunberg to pressure the politics or other form of uh, mobilization. So um, basically our, our threat, theoretical framework uh, follows on two um, big threads of literature. One is uh, environmental justice, which is both uh, an environmental movement and uh, uh, it has become a, a, a theoretical uh, framework for uh, um, social scientists and environmental scientists uh, working on this kind of issue. And the other thread of literature is political opportunity structure, uh, which uh, study all kinds of uh, mo social movements from um, in, the in, in, the, in, in its interaction with uh, politics. Uh, the founding father of that uh, political framework was uh, Charles, historian Charles Tilly, uh, specialist of French Revolution. And then you have names like uh, Sidney Taylor, Douglas McAdam. It's basically dominated by uh, American scholars, uh, but it has become uh, global. And uh, now you have, uh, I mean, scholars all, over, all around the world working on, on social issues uh, refer to that uh, thread of literature, including my colleague, uh, Hoi Ming Xiu, uh, co-edited this book with me. So we, we, we look at, uh, just to pick up uh, a, a few interesting case of, uh, I think, uh, emblematic case uh, cases studied in this book. We have, for example, the case of uh, um, climate justice in terms of climate litigation launched by uh, movements in in Indonesia or the Philippines. Uh, I think those uh, chapters on Indonesia and the Philippines are very uh, um, emblematic of what. Um, good example of what we have trying to address in this book. Um, we have a chapter on, in, on the case of Singapore, we put the focus on the justice for other species. Uh, Anthropocene, Anthropos is human, mankind, but it's, 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 it's to remind how much the impact of man is bad for the environment and other species. So we try to look beyond, uh, um, you know, this uh, man-centered, anthropocentric approach of environmental issues. And um, that's quite an interesting chapter for that. Um, then I think, uh, well, all chapters uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, the specific role of civil society in those uh, uh, 
mobilization. But there is a, a big gap in the political environment or, uh, of these countries. If you, the case of uh, Taiwan, uh, oh, I forgot to say that we focus on the last 20 years. Uh, so that's one, another reason to use the notion of Anthropocene because it was uh, invented 20 years ago. So we, we take it at, at, as a, a time framework. But um, so if you look at the case of Taiwan, Indonesia and Thailand for the last 20 years, well, Thailand is, is uh, more ambivalent, but uh, um, in Taiwan and Indonesia, I mean, democracy has clearly made huge progress. I mean, we need to mention about the case of Taiwan, but it, Indonesia also has, has, has truly uh, uh, made uh, um, important uh, improvement uh, for its democratic institutions. So here we have very strong civil societies. Um, in Thailand, it's more complicated uh, because uh, as the author of the chapter on, on Thailand emphasized, um, in the 1990s, uh, Thailand used to be a kind of model for uh, uh, pol uh, political ecologists, geographers, uh, working on, on environmental issues. Uh, but uh, since then, uh, um, Jack Reed, the, the, the author of this chapter, emphasized that uh, um, there was a, the environmental mobilization in Thailand that made a lot of compromise. And uh, this is partly uh, um, entangled with the crisis of democracy in Thailand. Did you think of the succession of, uh, of coup in this country? And, uh, and so uh, here we have a, to, to adopt more general tone, uh, it, we have a strong interaction between democracy and, and the, uh, the movement for democracy or, uh, or democratic institution, that development, and uh, the level of, of development of those environmental mobilization. It sounds like uh, obvious, but actually it is not. I will uh, go back on this point later. Um, then compare these cases with the case of Cambodia and the Philippines, uh, where Philippines rank among the most dangerous country in the world for environmental activists. Uh, many people are just killed. Uh, and don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's something uh, really atrocious. It's, uh, the author of the chapter on the Philippines mentioned about that. So he, he called call that a dangerous job. To be an environmental activist is a dangerous job. This is also the case in Cambodia. In Vietnam, people are not killed, but uh, like uh, in China, they can be arrested for or harassed for all kinds of reasons, including for a case I've been working on, uh, which is a case of marine pollution caused by the company Formosa Plastic. Uh, we have a lot of uh, human rights uh, issue there uh, because of that, uh, of people protesting and, and, and harassed and arrested and condemned to very harsh sentences, like uh, one sentence is up to 14 years in jail. So yeah, it's not a joke. It's, uh, but at least people are not killed. <laughs> uh, the Philippines is really the worst. It's the Philippines always uh, reminds me of uh, very close to the situation in South American countries like Colombia or, or Ecuador, Guatemala. Yeah. Nicaragua, this kind of, it's, it's, uh, well, it's, it's maybe not, uh, if you think of the history of the Philippines, where it was first a Spanish colony and then a US colony. So I guess this legacy is, uh, has to deal with the specific uh, uh, environment, political environment of, of, uh, of the Philippines. Now, an important uh, geopolitical factor we, try our best to address in, in this book is the China factor. Not all the chapters deal with it, but uh, uh, in particular, three chapter address it. It's the case of Cambodia, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Cambodia is clearly a client state of China now. So you have a lot of uh, hydroelectric uh, dams that are being built by uh, Chinese uh, state companies. Um, Taiwan will talk later. And in Vietnam, uh, I just mentioned about the case of Formosa Plastic. Um, interestingly, uh, all Vietnamese are very aware of this case because it is uh, from a local case of pollution, it, 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 uh, it developed to uh, it, um, um, 
inflated to become a, a national case of, of concern. And one reason is that uh, Vietnamese think that Formosa, they, got Formosa a, they think it's a Chinese company. There are several reasons, a couple of reasons for that, but the main reason are twofold. One is because uh, during the construction of that still it's a steel mill in central Vietnam, in Hatin province. Uh, a lot of Chinese uh, workers were uh, brought in by uh, Formosa Plastic and, and other companies to build that steel mill. And, and uh, uh, it happened that in 2014, uh, there was a riot uh, because of the aggressive posture of China in the South China Sea against the Vietnamese island. And uh, this uh, steered a lot of riots in Vietnam against Chinese properties. And some Chinese workers were killed at that time. Um, uh, you're probably aware of how Vietnam has, is, 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 uh, has turned from an anti-American country, I mean, because of the war with the US, to a, a very, uh, uh, how can I put that, nationalistically sensitive to uh, all kinds of things that is perceived as a Chinese intrusion in Vietnam. So uh, the case of Formosa is framed like this, although this company is a Taiwanese company. So that's kind of paradoxical. Uh, the, the book cover it, uh, took, we used two photos. The, 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 the photos of both. Uh, the photos on, on the upside is, is the, um, by uh, Kajimen, is the Formosa plastic plant in Yunli. Then the photo below uh, is, uh, we mixed two photos. Uh, on the upside is, is um, in Cambodia, in the, in the river in Cambodia, where people are, are they turn this, this small island in, in a, a sacred place uh, for some religious reason um, I'm not familiar with, but, uh, and they worship this place. And uh, the, la the, the photo below is this uh, a comedian lady from this place who was invited by the um, uh, Kalana, Mam Kalani, who made this do documentary movie, to visit Singapore, where the sands that are taken from this place are, 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 are exported to, uh, for the construction industry in Singapore. And uh, this give, I think it's a good symbol of how the, um, what we used to call the export of pollutions in, in the 1970s, you know, from countries to Japan or Taiwan to Cambodia, as turned now as a, a rough less exploitation of, uh, of third world countries. And, uh, but this kind of, of thing is not impeded in the global footprint of Singapore, which is one of the worst in the world. And uh, this is uh, something uh, which is almost uh, quite hidden also in the global, in the carbon footprint of Taiwan. But um, yeah, I think this is a way to link uh, local mobilization in different countries, how it, it, it can be uh, uh, connected with uh, the civil society of, uh, of uh, developed countries like Taiwan, Japan. And I will, I will go back on this point later for uh, the case of Formosa um, in, in, in um, plastic in, in Vietnam and how it is connected in, in, in Taiwan. Now, another, uh, in relation to geopolitical aspect, another, um, dimension that we try to address in this book is why what I mentioned about the relationship between democracy and, and the development of uh, environmental mobilization in many countries. But um, Gaudi, uh, Gaudi, he went as well, Gaudi. In the end. What is uh, democracy, uh, does it still matter in, in this Anthropocene? Um, in 2010, uh, um, um, a scholar called Mark Bisson uh, um, published uh, an article which is now uh, um, 
very often quoted when we talk about the uh, problem of democracy and, and environmental mobilization. And it, it, it choose the case of China and Singapore as almost uh, models of, uh, uh, of to address um, the challenges of uh, um, the environmental crisis of our time. And uh, this has become a model of environmental authoritarianism. Um, and uh, now we have a, a large thread of literature on that, so I won't follow on this. But uh, the question here is, uh, um, so does country like China, who can, uh, this has been said for the case of COVID-19, that uh, authoritarian country can address more effic efficiently uh, problem of uh, uh, pro problems like pandemics. And the same has been said for environmental issues, including global warming, that uh, China can cope with it uh, more efficiently because uh, when uh, Beijing says something, the whole country will move to uh, uh, do what uh, uh, Master Xi has said. Well, is that so simple? Actually, when we look at, uh, so <laughs> we, I took the opportunity of this book to uh, ask our colleagues to, to check, to, to do what, how, how can we measure that? Uh, how can we, com uh, can we check if uh, uh, democratic countries are lack, less efficient than authoritarian countries to address uh, environmental issues? Uh, uh, well, the, uh, to be quick, the answer is clearly no. Um, so I used, in the, in the conclusion of the book, I use uh, um, two kind of uh, rankings. Uh, one is uh, rankings for measurement of uh, democracy uh, standards. So, Est-ce que je repasse un peu petit Ah oui. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not sure. It, it it's very small. So, but if you can see, it's it. I I use three rankings. One is from Freedom House. Is the most famous. Was founded in. Uh, uh, a long time ago, 50 years ago, I think, but in, in Washington. And then we have uh, another uh, ranking from The Economist. And another, most, the most recent is uh, in uh, Sweden, it's from uh, Videm. Um, so they use different standards to measure the level of uh, 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 human rights uh, um, and uh, more generally the uh, level of freedom uh, or political freedom in, in different countries. So I just focus on, on the countries, the, uh, the chapters we have in this book. Um, and uh, let me go. And another kind of rankings I, I use is the, uh, the environmental rankings, um, which are less developed. But we have, uh, for example, the Yale Environmental Performance Index, the Global Footprint Network, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't include Taiwan because it's based on, on UN um, data, so uh, Taiwan is not in that. But we have also the German Watch Climate Change Performance Index. Uh, in this index, Taiwan is uh, label uh, Chinese Taipei, but never mind, we, we, it's uh, useful to make some comparisons. So I use this and that and, and those two uh, rankings, and my conclusion is that uh, we have uh, um, what I would call green democracies, which are, well, can always do better. And for sure, Taiwan has a lot, uh, a lot of things to improve. Uh, but I mean, it's compared to China and Singapore, uh, Taiwan is at least as good as China. It's, <laughs> uh, I, and, and so you have, I would compare green democracy versus green autocracy, or what I call purple democracy and purple autocracy. I use the color purple uh, because uh, I thought of the air pollution index, you know, it's uh, when it's, uh, we have a uh, air pollution uh, boom, we call it purple boom, right? Uh, the bottom. Uh, so yeah, this kind of, uh, but well, I don't want to put too much emphasis on these uh, indexes. It's just a rough, 
very rough, rough measurement of uh, uh, indication of uh, 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 what's going on. But what is important is, is for me, it, it comforts my uh, impression that uh, perhaps democracy uh, is uh, not always efficient, but if it, it can do things in such a way that is at least as efficient as authoritarian countries. Is that, <laughs> I know this is a very complex way of saying simple things, but well, it's uh, my conclusion. Um, I say my conclusion because the conclusion, uh, concluding chapter is mine, but I think my co-authors and uh, um, 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 are, are okay with that conclusion, yeah. Um, so now for the remaining uh, time of this uh, presentation, uh, I would like to focus on the case of Taiwan. Do, do you have some questions so far? On the, the... When you have two negatives, it's kind of hard to figure out what is the result. Like you said, the bottom, you, know, you said Taiwan is at the bottom of the countries that uh, are, I didn't quite understand what you Yes. Mean. I mean, it is not improved uh, very much. Yeah, this is actually, this is, uh, I referred to uh, uh, figures from the German Watch Institute, which has two index. What is, one is the climate change performance index. The other one is the climate change risk index. So Taiwan is both a victim of global warming because uh, uh, the uh, typhoons are more and more violent. and well, is yeah, this can be discussed. But well, at least according to the German Watch Institute, Taiwan is in the top ten of the countries most exposed to climate change, typhoon floods, uh, or last year we had on the contrary we had the lack of water, this sort of thing, which was absolutely exceptional. Um, so it is uh, obviously attributed to uh, uh, global warming, but not might be, but a lot of scientists. Uh, so Taiwan is a victim, but is also a contributor in uh, an, uh, how do you call it? A, a cause of global warming because of its its carbon emission, the, its carbon footprint are very important compared to the size of the population. So it's here, a very high footprint. A very high footprint. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's in the uh, sorry, it's in bottom of the list for uh, the countries. Yeah, because they, they rank first the countries that are doing rather good. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so bottom is, it's not doing well in terms of right, increasing right, CO2. Right, right, right. No, 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 it's, 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 it's I, I know it's confusing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm, I shift to the case of Taiwan. Uh, I, I call this chapter, a mental movement in Taiwan's Anthropocene, a civic eco-nationalism. So I will explain what I mean by civic eco-nationalism. Uh, here you have is, is, a, is a photo, uh, uh, to start with this photo of um, demonstration in Taipei, in Katagaran, in 2017, June. It was uh, soon after the death of, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, documentary movie, uh, uh, Taiwan from Above. Uh, I forgot his name now, but uh, yeah, it was it, because, come on. Chibolin, yes, Chibolin. He, he, he said, well, soon after he died in an helicopter crash uh, near the, 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 the um, mine of uh, Asia Cement in, uh, in uh, Hualien, in Xinjiang. And uh, this mobilization had been going on for decades when, the, when he died. But uh, this, uh, since his, his movie had been so popular, uh, Taiwan from above, and uh, <clears throat> His death broke attention on, on this case, and uh, and yeah, what I thought interesting is that why doing the shape of Taiwan for protesting? And actually, this is not an isolated case. I have uh, an, at least another another example of a demonstration of air pollution, which also took the shape of Taiwan. Uh, I guess it has to do with the introduction of drones. Now we have a in almost every demonstration, you would have drones watching us from above. So the the activists are aware that uh, we have uh, the, the drones will take pictures from above, and uh, 
yeah, they have this uh, way of uh, taking a, a, a memory picture of, of their mobilization. But for me, it's also a symbol of uh, um, this uh, ecological nationalism. So the notion of ecological nationalism, uh, here I, I draw on uh, uh, American political science scientist, uh, Drawson, who uh, studied the, the, the case of, um, of um, Soviet Union, uh, anti-nuclear movement in Soviet Union at the end when so Soviet Union became Russia. And uh, she observed uh, that uh, uh, so 30 years ago, she observed that uh, um, in that case, the anti-nuclear movement in former Soviet republics was a driver for nationalism of Russian nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism, Belarusian nationalism. But after Soviet Union became uh, Russia and the Federation of Russia and other republics uh, like Ukraine, um, the anti-nuclear movement totally faded away. So in the case of Taiwan, we have the exact opposite. Uh, I mean, for a while, uh, when I started this, uh, to study this issue in Taiwan in around 2007, 2008, um, the anti-nuclear movement was very almost ex extinct. Uh, the first time was maybe uh, long ago. The first time I met Linda was in what's that? 1998. Yes. At that time, the nuclear movement was very active, right? And we, you were a, a very active member of that. Uh, but in 2018, it was almost extinct. Then we had Fukushima nuclear disaster. Actually, I was on the. Um, you remember that, right? We were here. I was right doing this, uh, doing a presentation right here on Friday, uh, March 11, 2011, when this disaster occurred. And well, it's completely uh, changed a lot of things in my life in, uh, and uh, for many reasons I won't talk today, but yeah. And Fukushima nuclear disaster has a, had a, a huge impact in Taiwan and uh, for many reasons. Uh, but uh, this has been well studied by my colleague, uh, He Ming Xiu. So I draw on his, on his uh, research on this issue in this chapter, as well as other, um, some observation I did myself. And, uh, but uh, yeah, the anti-nuclear movement uh, has been uh, a strong driver of what I call uh, ecological nationalism in the sense that uh, protecting Taiwan is protecting Taiwan environment is is more and more uh, convergent um, congruent with uh, protecting Taiwan in general. So Taiwan Huangbao and Taiwan Hanwei Yue Lai Yue Hanwei and Huangbao it's different nuance in Chinese, I think, but so, and uh, to start with, uh, to, uh, no, not, uh, it's the kind of theoretical uh, framework I, I, uh, I, I, I reach in this, uh, I use for this chapter is, uh, so we have, like we have three spheres, uh, the sphere of nation, the sphere of democracy and the sphere of ecology. And what I call civic ecological nationalism is, is Delta in the center. Okay, and why did I had civic? Um, so we have, uh, so uh, alpha is uh, eco ecological nationalism, is when, when you have a combination of ecology and nationalism, okay? Uh, B, uh, beta is civic nationalism, uh, then civic environment, et cetera, et cetera. But I would like, uh, I won't go too much in the details, just like uh, uh, to be uh, shorter on this. Um, for, I'm not a specialist of, of, of uh, nationalist uh, nationalism issue, uh, um, so I, I. But I, I was always uh, um, puzzled by in the move, mobilization I observed here and there by what I felt like a, a kind of uh, convergence between uh, Taidu or uh, independentist or 
not necessarily independence, but people caring for Taiwan, politically speaking, on the international agenda. And uh, the Green Party is, is, has been especially vocal on this. It was the Green Party in Taiwan was very vocal for Taiwan as an independent country from the very beginning. Well, it changed thereafter. But this kind of example puzzled me. And I wanted to, uh, uh, took the opportunity of this chapter to uh, study um, how can we, um, Put together those two phenomena, environmentalism on one hand and nationalism on the other. So I followed on Craig Callum's famous book, Nations Matter, Why Nations Matter. Also my colleague uh, at uh, uh, Institute of Sociology, uh, Xiao Qin and, and, and Wang Fuchang. Um, and also um, who emphasized the rise of a specific and also uh, Frank, uh, Frank Muya, uh, uh, former uh, uh, director of the CFC Taipei. Uh, I'm glad you are here, Frank, today, because your, your chapters were very instrumental for me to uh, realize how much um, to depart from a, a popular thinking or common idea, not popular, but a common idea that uh, 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 nationalism uh, necessarily lead to ethnic hatred and neo-fascism. This kind of, uh, of uh, connection is, is often made in, in the Western Europe, in the US, in liberal left-wing cycles, which I belong to. <laughs> so I came from there and of, in Japan also. Nationalism, when, and, but it's, you, you know, it can be explained when, in Japan when you see those uh, um, extreme right-wing people going to Yasukuni and they have such an aggressive discourse. So of course, it's, it, it gives you the impression that every nationalism is, is necessarily linked to uh, uh, ethnic hatred and neo-fascism. But it's not. In Taiwan, I, I, I completely changed the way I look at these things. And uh, I think in, in that sense, Taiwan is an epistemic challenger to borrow uh, from a recent uh, uh, special issue of uh, the Journal of Taiwan Studies. Taiwan is an epistemic challenger for what, how we see the relationship between democracy and, and nationalism. So for this, I, 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 I invite you to, to read the excellent work of uh, Frank Muyar. Another idea, uh, oh, sorry, okay. Another, uh, oh, oh. Uh, I borrow from my colleague, Tanguy Le Pesant, who is here also today, so I'm very lucky to have both. So it's, you, you say it's the French connection. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, Tanguy has uh, uh, um, published a very interesting article, uh, I think uh, two, uh, three years ago, on environmental issues in Taiwan, uh, and the, the, contribution on, the contribution of young people, uh, the, the focusing on the case of young people. But I think what his conclusion uh, can be applied to uh, beyond uh, the specific group of young people. Uh, so he says, environmental issues, environmental issues contribute to reinforcing identification with Taiwan as a nation state. Um, and I, I, I draw from this that broadly non-partisan environmental activists enter into temporary political alliances when concern for Taiwan precarious status takes on a higher priority. Uh, typically during legislative and presidential elections or in situation where Taiwan is obviously bullied by, Taiwan, by China, like in, in the Olympic games or well, think all kinds of issues. In, in, in this specific situation, uh, you have a, a, a broad feeling that Taiwan is threatened and that, that of course, the environmental issues, uh, environmentalists will be part of that feeling. Uh, then I try to, I will give you some more concrete example. Um, how this uh, ecological feeling is interacting with, with uh, nationalism and why I will conclude why it is civic. I haven't explained yet why it is. I think it is a civic nationalism. Um, think about those Huan Pao. Oh, Huan Tao, okay. Huan Tao is touring around the island. And now you have this environmental touch, like you will, you will clean the beaches, you, you, will tour, you will tour Taiwan, which is a kind of, a, a, a read the passage for a lot of young people in Taiwan. I mean, all students do that. Not all, of them, but many students do that before they enter the um, 
when they finish the university uh, um, and then uh, but um, yeah some do had an additional touch like they win clear the beaches or, or uh, this kind of, 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 of touring Taiwan Another touring of Taiwan, a famous one, was in 2009 when uh, Chen Li-jun and uh, who later become uh, Ministry of Culture and Ni Xiong, uh, the, the, the veteran uh, anti-nuclear activist and, and DPP, um, um, uh, prominent member of DPP, uh, did a what they call bitter march of, of 1,000 kilometers, Chen Li Ku Xing. It was uh, uh, an, an important moment for the anti-nuclear movement at a time when the anti-nuclear movement was uh, very dormant but i found interesting the way they framed that that mobilization think of the uh, weekly program from public television gong gong tianshi woman the Dao. the very title woman the Dao. it's this is including it's inclusive and it's about the environment is uh, I wish we had a program like this in France or in Europe because uh, um, it's both it can be very harsh, very critical when it when they address cases of pol industrial pollution, uh, but yet it is a very nice, uh, friendly atmosphere when they introduce all kind of local uh, initiative to promote uh, protection of animals, of plants, of whatever. It's it's um, both. Uh, civic and nationalist in the sense uh, it's a civic nationalism, uh, a good symbol of civic nationalism. I think. Um, now I shift to uh, the interaction, how, how I mentioned about uh, the anti-nuclear movement and the bitter march of 2009. Another example can be uh, found in the case of air pollution, Fan Kong Wu in Dong. So I meant, oh, sorry. This one, the, the photo on the right is um, Igo Tian Kong, Younger Taiwan. This was in Taichung also in 2017, but uh, uh, February 2017. And um, people from Taipei uh, went there, so some uh, uh, um, uh, prominent figures of uh, uh, public health in Taiwan, like Zhang Changquan or um, Nobel Prize Li Yuanzhi went there also to, to support the uh, movement against air pollution, which air pollution is clearly Taiwan is cut into is uh, the, the, the Taichung and Kaohsiung are much more exposed to air pollution compared to uh, north uh, of Taiwan. Uh, so, of course, we have pollution coming from China in, in, in the winter, but uh, uh, the chronic pollution come mostly from uh, steel uh, factories, uh, thermal, uh, thermal um, power plants, um, coal power plants, and 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 other heavy industries, uh, which are concentrated in Kaohsiung and Taichung for historical reason. So here we have a, a kind of uh, national solidarity. People from the north coming to going to uh, central Taiwan to support them. Say, yeah, uh, Taiwan is cut in two, but we are um, kind of solidarity. Another important component of this uh, civic eco nationalism in Taiwan, I think, is the indigenous component. Yuan Zhuming the Gongxian or the Yuan Zhuming Yundong the Gongxian. Um, think about the all kind of mobilization for um, by Aboriginal people and by and with Han people. It, it's, 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 you have always a lot of young Han activists in 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 uh, working hand in hand with those Aboriginal people. Either is it for the nuclear waste in Lanyu. Uh, a lot of issues on the east coast of Taiwan. Here is uh, uh, the case I, 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 I choose to study. It's the case of the Asia cement mine I mentioned already. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit, uh, to, to go there and make some interviews. Um, oh, there should be an article in Le Monde uh, 
perhaps tomorrow or uh, in coming days about this issue because there was a recent decision from the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Administrative Supreme Court, two weeks, uh, one week ago, and um, and um, yes, and but basically. Uh, 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 how can I put this? I think the activists have been doing the best they could and uh, always keeping uh, the legal way. Uh, but so they, they choose to, to start to launch a, a lawsuit. But and they won't. They won the case. But basically, un unless the law is changed, the law for the, the, the basic law for mining industry, uh, the law on mines is changed, uh, basically Asia Simon can keep on digging the mountain, which is, uh, it's, uh, I didn't put the photo here, but you have the, the, the catch, the Simon catch is just over uh, uh, the village and it's just jug jug geologically speaking, very dangerous. It's always threatened to collapse on the, the mine threatens to collapse on the village. But so it's it's very obvious case of uh, uh, environmental injustice and racism against this uh, Fruku people. Uh, but um, uh, basically the Ministry of Economy uh, supports uh, cement, the cement company, the cement industry, for a couple of reasons. So here we have uh, really uh, a problem. <laughs> uh, and, and this indigenous component is, uh, plays a very important role in boosting the environmental groups. Because I think uh, the case of uh, Aboriginal, the solidarity of young Han ecological activists with Aboriginal people can be compared with the solidarity of uh, what I see in the US, in the case of, uh, in Louisiana. Uh, now we have a very strong mobilization in Louisiana against uh, uh, the, the plant of Formosa plastic, um, uh, which is, wants to build another uh, huge plastic plant over there. And uh, those are black people communities. So the, the friends in the US who are mobilized against this case, put it as an emblematic case of environmental racism. So I think uh, the black communities in the U.S. are 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 so. The, and here's the strong movement for the solidarity against environmental injustice in terms of you know uh, black communities uh, can be compared in the case of Taiwan with the um, the situation of what everybody a lot of people feel as an injustice. Not everybody, <laughs> but a lot of people feel feel as an abuse injustice against against Aboriginal people. Even if they want, even if they win the, the lawsuit, uh, their case is not. Uh, I mean, the company just can just disregard uh, and continue digging. Another, uh, and I will finish with this for uh, this chapter. Um, I mentioned also the case of uh, because it's what I've been studying for the last uh, uh, ten years. Uh, two cases of uh, environmental litigation. Uh, collective lawsuit, uh, and the first of all is the case of Taiwan RCA, um, in the sense that environmental lawyers play a very important role in many mobilizations, I observe. Uh, there is an emphasis on law, and I guess here it is, uh, in China also we have a lot of environmental litigation, but um, compared to Taiwan, I think they don't get what people can get in Taiwan. Well, I, I don't want to go too much into the comparison with China, but it's because it's complicated. But uh, um, I think this uh, the the role of environmental lawyers in 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 those cases is is very important and, and important component of this uh, civic eco nationalism in a sense. The respect they each, they show a lot of respect for le legal procedures. They are very procedural in that sense. So if you want to learn. I've, published recently uh, an article about this case, uh, which kind of uh, synthesis of what I've been observing for a couple of years on this case. Uh, another case that uh, I've also published an article on, on this is the case of Formosa Plastic, I mentioned already. In this uh, article focused on the case of Yunlin, um, 
And here also we have a lawsuit which uh, doesn't go as smoothly as the victims would, the plaintiffs would hope, but uh, still it's important position. And another case of uh, collective lawsuits is very special. It is also against Formosa Plastics and its related companies, but the plaintiffs here are 7,000 Vietnamese people, uh, um, fishermen folk from central Vietnam, who are the victims of the marine pollution caused in, in 2016 by the marine pollution caused by the um, Formosa Hattin steel plant. So this plant is, is uh, the main, main investor is Formosa Plastic, up to 75%. The second investor is uh, China Steel, so also Taiwanese company. Um, yeah, that's another reason why Vietnam you think it's a Chinese company, because the investor is called China Steel. So yeah. And uh, the third investor is, is a Japanese uh, GFE, but uh, to a, only a 5%. So it's mainly uh, it's the responsibility of, of Formosa Plastics. And then the company has acknowledged that they were the cause of the pollution. So the, uh, with the cooperation of uh, environmental lawyers in Taiwan, and with the help of, uh, uh, of uh, lawyers in the US and Canada, uh, they have launched a group of, of support for the victims in Vietnam. And I think this is very, uh, very, very interesting, fascinating case of uh, transboundary solidarity uh, which the result of this uh, very dynamic uh, civic eco-nationalism in Taiwan, which now goes much beyond the, 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 the limited frontier of Taiwan. So if you think of the complexity for Taiwan to uh, address a lot of uh, environmental issues, uh, I mean, a lot of international issues, um, this case is, is, is fascinating. They had the idea of using Vietnamese law, but to apply it to the, 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 the uh, in, in, in the Taiwanese court. It is a possibility in, in Taiwanese law. Uh, they are so imaginative, the, the lawyers and, and, and uh, so I have been uh, participating in, as, a, uh, in, in this, in, as an observer in this movement. And I, I think that the lawyers are very uh, creative. They, 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 they have this, uh, the, the, uh, the, power of imagination through 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 legal issues, which is very fascinating. So I mentioned already, uh, uh, this is what I'm uh, currently uh, conducting research on. This is this tr transboundary uh, mobilization uh, against uh, Formosa plastics uh, in Taiwan, in Vietnam, and Texas and Louisiana. Uh, and this is a very, uh, very interesting uh, case also of, of, of transnational solidarity of this uh, uh, civic eco-nationalism. And uh, the report on the right was just published uh, yesterday. And uh, um, uh, we have, uh, in Taiwan, we have also contributed to this. Uh, it's called a serial offender because this was the name, uh, the, the, the expression used by uh, um, a judge in Texas against Formosa Plastic. It, the judge described the company as a serial offender, <laughs> I like the, the expression. Um, so, uh, Nathaniel, en fait, j'ai encore quelques slides. Je prends encore 10 minutes. J'avais prévu de m'arrêter là, mais en fait, je suis dépassé. Je parle trop. Encore 10 minutes? OK. So I take another 10 minutes uh, to, uh, to uh, bring some uh, issues I would like to discuss with you. Um, the first issue is about um, this transfer this transboundary activism and what what is the geopolitical meaning for Taiwan of this transboundary activism? It's, it's a question I have in mind now. Um, if you think of this mobilization with uh, uh, Vietnamese and, and American um, uh, environmental groups, I was uh, uh, struck when the a Republican senator, Barack Picot, says uh, um, in Louisiana in June, I recently said that Formosa Plastic has been a, a very a very good friend of Louisiana. So uh, he wanted to send a strong message to Formosa Plastic and Taiwan. And then we had uh, the Democratic Karen uh, Carter-Peterson who replied, no, 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 no. Uh, 
I, I totally agree that the Louisiana state supports the Taiwan. Taiwan. It's something the Louisiana state has been doing for the last 10 years. Every year, they, they, they make a statement to support Taiwan. I didn't know that. It's interesting. <laughs> we learned. And, 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 but this year, uh, and the Democratic uh, uh, senator, uh, um, member of, of the state of Louisiana, said, no, I support the, 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 the Taiwan, uh, but I don't want that Formosa plastic become the symbol of Taiwan. <laughs> and I think there was very interesting detachment. Another interesting uh, uh, statement I heard recently from uh, uh, mobilization. So Diane Wilson is the, uh, the, the, the uh, leading uh, organizer of the mobilization in Texas against Formosa plastic. She, she's a shrimp farmer and, sh and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, she's very famous. And I was struck when she mentioned uh, during uh, one of our uh, events that uh, I had to, uh, we were talking about, uh, I forgot what was the issue, but she declared this. I had the opportunity to visit Taiwan about 30 years ago. And it's one of the greatest things that happened to me. Building connections between this small county in Texas, so where she lives in, in, in Point Comfort, and people all the way over in Taiwan. And these connections have remained, as you can see today, they are still there 30 years later. So I think interesting because uh, I was afraid sometimes that this kind of mobilization, mobilization could be understood as anti-Taiwan and uh, anti-Formosa, you know, no Formosa. That, but actually, I think the, the way they frame the things is, is clearly uh, in, an indicator that uh, those people understand very well that on the other, on the opposite, working together with Taiwanese people is, is the best way to uh, get a better result in Texas and Louisiana against Formosa plastic. So here we have a de uh, detachment from um, big business and, and civil societies. I think it's interesting. Now, if we think of uh, uh, now the government of Taiwan is very uh, supportive of uh, to achieve uh, what is called net zero. It's to achieve net zero by 2015, uh, 2050. Sorry, 2050. Um, we had a strong declaration uh, of signing one in 2016, but and then nothing happened. <laughs> I guess nothing happened because it was the Biden. Uh, no, no, uh, Trump administration uh, it was. Uh, not very supportive to uh, this kind of uh, uh, carbon reduction uh, targets. But it's st it started again this year, and I guess uh, the Biden administration is, 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 is uh, uh, partly responsible for, for that uh, uh, sudden change. Um, it's, it's not a change. I think uh, it's something the government, uh, well, I'm not in Taiwan head, but I think it's something uh, the government really wanted to do. But uh, yeah, the, the Diplomatic environment, to say the least, was not supportive of that. But now it is. Um, yet Taiwan has a very poor performance, as I mentioned. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this notion of the Earth Overshoot Day. Uh, it's on August. Uh, for the whole, globally, it's it's on uh, August first. It means when the the, the international community has spent all its carbon resources. So for the rest of the year, we, we live on a debt, on an ecological debt. Well, it's a concept. Right? And, uh, and uh, for Taiwan and the US, actually we have, uh, uh, in 2018, it was the same for US and Taiwan. <laughs> it was on March 14. So on March 14, Taiwan and the US have spent their ecological debt for the end of the year. Uh, the country which, which does the best is Indonesia, it's in December, but well, for other reasons, Indonesia is not, uh, there's a lot of problems in Indonesia, as I but, but, and China is in the middle in June. So Taiwan and the US can improve a lot, they are carbon footprints. Um, the main problems come from industry. Uh, more than half of, of the carbon footprint in Taiwan comes from the manufacturing sector, and 70% uh, of the manufacturing sector come from uh, so-called harder to abate uh, four sectors, petrochemical, electronics. So yes, Taiwan is the world leader for semiconductors, but it has a heavy, 
impact uh, on the environment, uh, than steel and cement. So I just mentioned about Asia cement. That could be a, a good reason to pressure the Asia cement to stop its uh, catching in 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 Hualien. But uh, the worst is the petrochemical industry. That's the reason why I'm working on the. Uh, now I'm, I'm focusing on this industry for for with uh, my little research team. Uh, we have a. Um, um, research um, program sponsored by Academia Sinica on what we call the plasticine. So <laughs> Anthropocene, it's a plasticine. Uh, uh, plastics are a, a big component of the Anthropocene. And uh, we look at the uh, uh, case of the petrochemical industry. Okay, uh, just if you can give me five minutes because I really would like to talk a little bit with you about the referendum. In the chapter, I, I have a, a small part, uh, which I call political uses of environmental issues. Actually, it was much longer. The, the, the first, my first draft uh, uh, was much, much longer. And my colleagues thought that uh, I was not neutral enough. So I won't tell you why I was not neutral enough, but I say, no, Paul, you should be more objective and uh, okay but so i try to be objective now but uh if i'm not please correct me uh, okay so uh in the 90 up to very recently up to the reform of the referendum act in, in december 2017 um the referenda linked to environmental issues were very limited and uh, uh we had uh no, maybe. So they were limited to uh, some local communities and it was very difficult because the threshold for um, uh, getting the approval for uh, conducting a ref uh, referendum was very high. Then in December 2017, 17, due to pressure from Pan Green Camp and anti-nuclear activists, it was reduced. Uh, so, uh, but this uh, uh, fought back for the, uh, for the Green Camp and the anti-nuclear anti camp. If we look, take a look at uh, uh, the, the, so in, in the chapter I mentioned about the case of the referendum and the local elections of November, 2018. So they were combined. So we had a multi-question referendum of 10 questions. Uh, that was a mismatch. I mean, very indigest. Uh, um, 10 questions on uh, nuclear issue, LGBT issue, and uh, energy issue. The first referendum was, uh, and food safety, yeah, nationally and uh, national energy. So the first uh, was uh, uh, introduced by Huang Shixiu, uh, uh, pro nuclear for the environment, for the environmental pro nuclear, eco nuclear, I can't say, Yi He Yonglu. And the KMT supported his, his, his bid. But the KMT also supported uh, the a proposal to stop the import of irradiated food from Japan. And they, they saw no contradiction between the two. Oh, right? You should say a little more about Yu Yang. Yi Ho Yang Lu. But if I do so, I won't have time to talk. Uh, no, but we can discuss later. Yeah, you, will, yeah, you are welcome to. I, I would just would like to conclude now, and so we can discuss. And um, the result of that com a combination of having the multi-question -re referendum and the local election at the same time was a defeat for environmental and LGBT groups and an electoral defeat for DPP. The seven questions proposed by the KMT, Pan Blue, Pro Nuclear, and Anti-LGBT Camp were adopted, while the three questions proposed by the Pan Green, DPP, Anti-Nuclear, and Pro LGBT Camp were rejected. I found that during the campaign, the DPP was very passive. Uh, and environmental and LGBT groups were in difficulty to reply to pro-nuclear KMT and very aggressive anti-LGBT groups. But at least clearly we had two camps. Uh, 
I would say pan blue, pro nuclear, and anti LGBT. And well, it was not mentioned, but it's re relatively pro China versus a pan green, pro nuclear, uh, anti nuclear, and supportive of LGBT. Uh, the pro LGBT. And uh, there was not safe, but most of them were pro independence or at least pro statical. Now, if we take a quick look at the coming referendum in December, uh, we have two proposals from, well, briefly speaking, Huang uh, Bao. One is, once again, Huang Shixiu, so the pro nuclear um, ecologist. Uh, we used to be, if that was, you want me to say. He was uh, secretary for Hong Shishu, the former head of the KMT. So he has clear link with the KMT. So although the, the KMT does not officially support uh, this referendum, it is for many uh, reasons, uh, uh, I think the KMT does support him a lot, okay? And and once again, this is a very long, uh, infinite, problem of the four nuclear plants, okay? Um, do you agree that the four nuclear plants start to produce electricity? Uh, yeah, then I think for this referendum, it, it, the, it's not a problem for environmental groups. They're all against nuclear, most, I mean, except this guy and, 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 and his coalition, but all other environmental groups are against nuclear energy. So it's not a problem. What is more problematic is the referendum on the uh, algae recife in Taoyuan. And look at the question. I mean, I tried to translate that in English, but I'm not sure it's, it makes sense. Do you agree that the third natural gas receiving station of the C, uh, so Zhong Shui, CNPC will be moved away from the coast and waters of Taoyuan's data algae reef? Quote in, in parenthesis, that is to say from the estuary of Guanyin River in the north to the estuary of Xingwu River in the south and a sea area of five kilometers extending parallel to the lowest tide line of the coast. I don't know how environmental groups are going to deal with that, but we have two other questions from and, and explicitly supported by the KMT and during the recent transfer from uh, Johnny Chiang to uh, Eric Ju, they made clear they would uh, spend efforts on the coming referendum to, uh, uh, well, for political reason, obviously. And uh, the first is about bounding referendum with the election. And you know, from what I just say about the 2018 referendum, it's ob the reason is obvious, <laughs> because you can uh, blur the boundaries between uh, what is, uh, you, can, uh, you can create a lot of confusion uh, among the electors about what is that issue, uh, whatever the issue, but uh, it's just a, a good way to, uh, well, Clearly, they understood that uh, the 2018 uh, multi-question referendum was very, very good for the KMT. So they want to repeat that again. But for this referendum, should be connected with uh, should occur at the same time with uh, local elections. And we have uh, another question about uh, uh, you know against the, the import of uh, uh, pig meat from the U.S., which has been a, a matter of. Uh, uh, well used by the KMT during the, the recent months. Now, I took a quick look at uh, different uh, environmental groups I'm familiar with. Uh, the first is Lumon, Green Citizen Action Alliance, to try to identify what, 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 are, what are the positions so far. And uh, well, uh, Green Lumon is, is, is uh, more or less supportive of the government. So the government has made a proposal. Uh, uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, maybe we should have another uh, 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 seminar. seminar about this. Maybe we, yeah. we have some very good uh, specialists of corals here in, in Sinica. And actually they have, they are, uh, some of them are like Chen uh, Zhaolun, uh, Alan Chen uh, was has been very active for the to raise awareness about the importance of that algae reef. Um, he's not the one at the origin of the referendum, but um, anyway. So we have the Green Citizen Alliance, which is supportive of the alternative introduced by the government in in the 
in around May this year uh, to find a compromise between, okay, we should build this tem gas terminal because, because it will be helpful to decrease uh, the impact of air pollution due to uh, coal uh, thermal plant and also our, uh, the carbon footprint of Taiwan. Uh, so we need a gas terminal because gas is, is, is has less impact on, in terms of, of carbon emissions. Uh, so Lu Meng found that, uh, yeah, more or less the government has, has done a good compromise, but they don't, so far, they haven't said that so clearly. So uh, I look forward, I would, I would, they would, uh, I think at one point they will, uh, give some clear indication to their supporters what how should people vote on 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 the day how should they answer the question but uh, they haven't done so so far uh dichu gongming citizen of the earth taiwan is also uh, quite supportive of the government's alternative proposal uh and it's, it's even clearer than uh Lumo. um i guess they will also make a, a clearer uh, statement how, uh, to to invite their supporters to uh, uh, how they should vote on, on 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 the day of the referendum. Now, more problematic is the Wider Hurt Legal Defense Association. They are good friends. I know them well, but I, I think, well, of course, they they propose and say, okay, this algorithm is so important, uh, so they they are not uh, they do not support the alternative from the government, or at least. Not clearly against, but yeah, they show they are not favorable. And they, they propose as an alternative to build this gas terminal in, in, in the place of the forced nuclear plant. Uh, that's a very sexy proposal, but uh, how is it really realistic? I don't know, but yeah. I, and Huang uh, Bao you know, it used to be the strongest environmental group in Taiwan 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's just uh, the shadow of itself. And uh, um, so it's not really important to uh, notice what they say. And, and basically, uh, it was a, a mention of the president during a press conference with who is in the center is Thomas Chan. Thomas Chan, Jan uh, Shungui Lu Shu, is a, is a um, uh, leading environmental lawyer in Taiwan who has been involved in a lot of cases as I've, I've been studying, in particular the, the lawsuit in, in against Formosa Plastic in Yunlin. And he has been uh, vice minister of the environment in uh, a few years ago. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry for Hwamari Aymang, but they're really not uh, influential anymore. So uh, sorry for <laughs> speaking so long um, and thank you very much for your patience. I hope it's, uh, uh, you have a lot of comments and so we can discuss, uh, I don't know, how you would like to discuss. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So, so thank you for this uh, very interesting and timely uh, lecture. Maybe we can have another uh, seminar uh, after the referendum is uh, is over. Um, just uh, so, so we're gonna go to the fifth questions. Uh, just for for our uh, friends who are uh, watching this uh, on YouTube, I will uh, monitor uh, the chat uh, so you can ask questions, and I will ask uh, for the question that you uh, will type. They cannot ask already. No. Okay, no, no, so you... just on the on the chat, and uh, and I will uh, ask the questions. Uh, so thank you, Paul, again, and uh, let's open the floor to uh, questions and comments. Uh, first, by the public, by the audience here, and uh, I will ask you the question of the the, the, the internet questions. Thank you. Oh, mais j'espère qu'on va voir ma tête tout le temps. Et qu'on voit les autres. Questions? Yes, please. So maybe we take a couple of questions from the floor? Yeah, sure, sure, okay. sure. Let, let's do that. So let me tap them. So Linda, yes. I'll try to, I will try okay. to. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do very well with this. I'll try to talk anyway. Okay, so I have comments, uh, maybe not questions, uh, because my participation in the environmental. But sorry, try to be short so to give a chance for other. Yes. I know, I know you can be very long, so. Yes, but my. <laughs> My main participation preceded you by about 10 years. Yes. From the 1990s to, 19, uh, to 2007, after that I was too busy teaching. 
but uh, of course I was uh, one of the very early members of the Green Party. And you are not quite correct to say that uh, the Green Party was uh, part of the Taiwan independence movement. Uh, let's say realistically, it was part of this stream, but the Green Party had a very conscious decision uh, to avoid uh, a position on Taiwan independence or unification. Basically, they didn't want to become mired in that issue because they wanted to have support both from any, you know, from any sector which was environmentalist. And you have to remember it was founded in 1996. And a part of a, a big part of the reason it was founded was a reaction against the DPP failing to stand up for nuclear power for stopping nuclear power plant number four. Okay, in 1994, the DPP legislators failed to fight on the issue and let the appropriation pass. Okay, so of course this issue has evolved, and I want to say that uh, I forget exactly the year, but about 2003, maybe the first time, several times. KMT figures, young KMT people, seem to try to infiltrate and partly uh, take over Green Party, but they were not successful. So nowadays we see this kind of opportunism on, uh, on environmental issues by the KMT. Okay, so that's my, my first point. But of course, yeah. this is issue since you're talking about nationalism. Uh, there should be more. But the, the environmental movement, especially the Green Party, uh, has seized the DPP as being as hypocritical, that is, as being hypocritical on the environmental issues, but still very much more subject to being swayed. And it does have a background of uh, originally support for environmental issues and some basis in the environmental movement. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my other general comment is as I look at your chapter, it's looking back from the present time. Over a, over a history, but it's really just kind of covering the history, which is after the breakthroughs were already made. Okay, so the, there were there were a series of earlier breakthroughs, which I feel your chapter doesn't really show enough. I focus on the last twenty years. That was the purpose yeah. of the book. Okay, okay. So you do you focus on the last twenty years, and the breakthroughs are about at that time, right? And one thing is, uh, environmental law could not go any place earlier because, for example, the case against RCA, anyone bringing the case had to make a deposit of 10% of the amount of money which was being sued for. So any environmental NGO suing for millions of dollars could not come up with that money. So RCA could only, that case could only proceed because Senju, who was the head of the labor department, gave, uh, lent the money for that case. Okay, so that's an example. There are also a lot of security agencies and other things before that 20 years or before 15 years ago, which were impediments and stopped the environmental movement. So I would, I would like to see maybe from my perspective of the earlier period to uh, have a history which shows more accurately this uh, long period of development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me stop there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Want to take uh, other questions? Yeah, maybe yeah. shorter. Uh, yeah. Yes. Attends, on va essayer de. Non, non, ça va être. Je pense que ça va être. Non, non. Je pense que ça va être. Non, non. Je pense que ça va être. Non, non. Oui, mais bon, alors on voit. Alors bien, à côté. On fera deux. Thanks, Bob. Je voulais juste Peut-être qu'il faut que tu parles plus fort, j'ai peur qu'on t'entende pas. C'est pas, pas grave, on répétera. Non, bah vas-y, parle. It's contradictory. Yeah. Okay, maybe yeah. so. Maybe, I, maybe we'll be different I try questions. To, yeah. yeah. Another question? Yes. I think I have an addition. Thank you yeah. so much for your talk. And actually, I was just curious because I saw there was a chapter on Hong Kong in the book. And I was yes. sort of curious whether what you call civic eco nationalism 
to found, find some echo in the Hong Kong situation. Yes. Whether we could talk about the localist environmentalism in the Hong Kong. Yeah. 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 How yeah. Is the dynamic yes. Okay. Well, maybe we. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I, I answer this. We we'll begin with okay. this. Okay, thank you very much for uh, Linda's comment. Okay, Linda, I think, yeah, as I said, it's, this is, uh, this, the book was uh, focused on the last 20 years. So uh, I did not, or only very briefly mention a few important things about uh, the post uh, um, and Ho, like, uh, post uh, martial law area. And uh, I think I did mention about the introduction of the Legal Aid Foundation, which was founded in 2003 as an important breakthrough for those. Uh, and that's why we had, thereafter we had a lot, uh, not, not a lot, but we had uh, several collective lawsuits, like the case of Taiwan RC, I've as, uh, as been involved with uh, almost 20 years now, actually. Mostly 10 years, but uh, yeah. So it started, uh, it's a long story, but to make it short, I think uh, I agree. Uh, no, I understand what it's your experience. I, you, you know much better than me, but about the Green Party. Actually, I, and now I'm reading uh, David's fair book on, on the Green Parties in Taiwan. Actually, uh, I, I used to look at the Green Party as, as uh, an environmental movement rather than a political party. I think you did a good job to create this party and to make it a political party. But for me, it was only a component, a modest component of the environmental movement at large. That's how I see it. Now I, I, I'm reading David's, uh, David's book uh, on the Taiwan Greens Party, a, a very, very good and fascinating book. Uh, um, I, I, I changed my view on that. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I understand that the DPP uh, was, uh, it's, it's always the point, I mean, and with the referendum also now, uh, that the refer why the environmental movement has tried its best to depart itself from the DPP. So, but it was confusing for a lot of reasons. Uh, Fan Lu, the green camp, <laughs> you have the green camp and the green parties. Well, it's it's this kind of. I mean, for most pan blue voters, uh, the Green Party was just an 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 a uh, what uh, appendage appendage <laughs> of, of the DPP. I'm sorry, it is the the way it's understood, and it was not totally false in a sense. I mean, Pan Hansheng and Pan Hanjiang have worked for the DPP for a while, and and so there's many connections between the DPP and the Green Party despite efforts of the, of the Green Party to depart itself from the DPP. You could say the same for Huang Bao Lianmang. You could say the same for Lu Mang today, because Pan Hansheng, who is uh, now the representative uh, law, uh, for the DPP at the Li Fa Yuan, <coughs> comes from Lu Mang. Ji um, Chu Gongming is uh, more independent regarding DPP. But well, if you know the members, uh, I'm pretty sure they all vote. I'm pretty sure who they vote for in time of the presidential election. I mean, they would probably cast their vote for the Green Party or another uh, smaller party. Uh, but uh, for the presidential ticket, I guess they voted Tsai Ing-wen. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, it's it's a secret, but. Uh, and the other environmental groups, most of them are, are I think they make a difference when uh, they try to promote the Green Party when they can, they try to promote other small parties when they can, and they try their best to detach the, uh, uh, their mobilization from uh, an appendix of, being an appendix of the DPP. That I, I, I think there's been those, their efforts for the last 20 or 30 years. But even though it remains that when you have to vote, you have to decide for someone. And the choice is always between DPP and KMT. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure their choice, 
For the best, they won't, they won't vote for KMT. For the worst, they won't. No, for the worst, they won't vote for DPP, but I'm pretty sure they would never vote for the KMT. Yeah, except the for KMT except for very rare exception, like like Liu Shuxiu, mm -hmm. who brought this uh, brilliant idea, if you think about it. Yi He Yong is stupid, but it, I mean, oh, no, it's, it's, uh, no, it's not neutral. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's scientifically, it doesn't make sense, but it's politically, it's very well done. And, and it, it, it worked in 2018 for the referendum, it worked. Okay, so just uh, to respond to uh, Linda's comment. Uh, Tongi, yeah, <laughs> so you, <laughs> you found me. Uh, yes, there was, uh, so I, as I said, it's very rough estimation and uh but i did not distort the facts i did not distort the rankings so th this this was based on the rankings so and in in the rankings from yale uh taiwan has a very good score and in the ranking from i don't know but you yeah, yeah, to, uh, but you, know, you know about rankings it's it's, it's always problematic okay then then then, then uh, okay then Okay, then we'll discuss about rankings. So these, these categories I made, I, and this is in the concluding chapter, I, I referred to them based on those, on those rankings it, and no other things. So as economists would say, everything's being equal. <laughs> so it's only, I, I, so I referred to the ranking and it's not my fault. Taiwan has a very good score in the Yale ranking and a very bad score in the German Watch Institute. So, because they, they look at different things. I, I, I didn't go into the, in the, 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 the their, their kitchen, but I think they look at different things. So they have different standards. Um, so that's, that's why Taiwan, I, I frame Taiwan as a green democracy compared to uh, China or Singapore as, as a green autocracies. Uh, you can also contest me. If you compare with France, for example, if you compare uh, carbon emission per inhabitant per year with France, the Taiwanese emits 2.5 more carbon than France. Okay, okay. So, no, but I, democracies. I was not leaders. comparing Taiwan and France. I was comparing China and, and Taiwan. With, with the European Union, which is made of democracies. So if you want to say green democracy, I think, in fact, Taiwan is at the bottom of the list. Not only Canada, uh, Australia and the United States. That's, that's so you would put more. Taiwan as a, a purple Taiwan democracy, which is which is a neutral. No, no, no. But if if you use my categories, you you have only four choices: green democracy versus green. I would put it in orange. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> so it's orange democracy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, uh, Justine, wait. Um, yeah, Hong Kong, uh, uh, it's, it's, um, it was really painful, uh, the case of Hong Kong, because uh, actually this book is uh, based on the conference we launched in 2017, uh, at the end of 2017. Then, uh, you know, the, it was, uh, Academic books so or the review is very long and so on. Um, and um, when we were about to finish the manuscript, the first manuscript it was in 2019, and uh, we had this strong movement against the uh, retrocession law. No, anti extradition law. 2019. Anti extradition. Anti extradition law, thank you. And um, and that the, our colleagues, uh, well, until now we push first attention. Uh, <laughs> no, it's extremely sensitive. So actually, we had to make a couple of arrangements regarding the chapter of Hong Kong. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, conditional for the publication because now you know you have to be very careful for scholars in Hong Kong. So there was a lot of things that uh, were said in that chapter that would go in the direction you mentioned. But we had to step back um, because of uh, yeah, it was sensitive. Is that self censorship? 
Maybe we'll talk about it's, it. It's protection of my colleagues, okay? Just, just, just after yeah, well. I'm, I'm just going to ask a question from the internet and then close the live uh, after that so we can talk. Yeah, uh, yeah. This more kind of question we can keep about, about, about yeah. this. So, so just one question from the from the chat um, by uh, Paul Rema. Uh, what lessons can civic eco-nationalism in Taiwan add to our understandings of the formation and mobilization of environmental movement in illiberal societies such as China, Vietnam, and Cambodia? <laughs> <laughs> What lessons, je répète, hein? what lessons can civic eco-nationalism in Taiwan add to our understandings of the formation and mobilization of fundamental movements in illiberal societies? Okay, yeah, okay. So what's the, yeah. Basically what, what environmental democracies like, or orange democracies like <laughs> Taiwan can teach to uh, uh, green or uh, purple authoritarian regimes like, I, I think nobody has anything to teach to anybody. <laughs> I, I mean, otherwise you 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 become in in in, in a, you know the the the, the posture of uh, the donneur de leçon. It's kind of colonizing posture of the which has been sorry, Linda, it's not you, but I mean this kind of you know the arrogant Western pro. Uh, the, the, the free world. You know, this part of the, this rhetoric actually is uh, can be easily uh, defeated. But I think it's not the way. I I I think the 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 the, the what I call the, this civic civic eco nationalism in Taiwan is much more um, is smarter than that. Is smarter than just giving lessons to other country. And they, they don't, for example, if I take the, the case of, okay, let me focus on the case. I think it's a very interesting question. I'm not criticizing question, but I, what I mean is that I don't see that those Taiwanese groups are tend, are pretty to give listen, lessons to other countries. They are mod, rather modest. First, because Taiwan is, is non-existent on in the international scene, I mean, Officially, right? Uh, so they are really more in search of help from others. So actually, uh, the way the environmental lawyers and their um, the environmental groups are helping the Vietnamese in the case of Formosa Plastic in Vietnam, I think is very emblematic of that approach. It is very modest in the sense they focus, they are very pragmatic. They focus on what they can do now to help those Vietnamese people. And uh, there is, there are two ways. One way is to to start this the, the, the litigation at the court in Taipei, so uh, bringing the files of seven thousand plaintiffs from Vietnam was really a, a very difficult uh, uh, something very difficult to, to to do. You can imagine how uh, to collect the data the, the files from from Vietnam was uh, even a politically sensitive issue, but they, they succeeded in doing that. Um, and, and, and the other approach is to go through the channels of uh, foreign overseas Vietnamese uh, uh, um, and which were uh, very numerous in, in the US, Canada, France, and Australia. And with the support of these uh, overseas Vietnamese, they collect funds uh, to, 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 uh, to start the lawsuit and also to apply to the United Nations. There is a committee called uh, Committee for the Freedom of Association, Committee for the Human Rights. And you can do what is called a UPD, a Universal Periodic Review. And uh, so we have uh, uh, provided information to our friends in the US. I say we because, oh, okay, we, I was involved a little bit in that, uh, but, uh, just a uh, bit. To provide information to the groups in the US, in Canada, and, and those groups will apply for our mobilization here in Taiwan, but for the case of Vietnam. So you see, it's, it's a very transboundary um, um, collaboration, and in no way the Taiwanese are giving lessons, lessons to uh, other countries. But if you mean that 
what can we learn from a, um, a school academic uh, uh, view from above, uh, which I try to avoid as a sociologist, actually, I don't like to think, look at things from above, but I prefer to look from within and to frame my way uh, into that. But um, I don't know. I, 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 I would stick to my very conservative conclusion that uh, I'm not sure uh, green democracies can, do, can be more efficient than authoritarian uh, regimes, but at least they won't be worse. Uh, Tanguy Lopezon just mentioned that maybe Taiwan is not a green democracy. It's not a purple democracy. He said it's maybe an orange democracy. Okay, <laughs> I agree. It's it's fine. It's it's, it's just uh, I, I use those rankings as, as a rough indicators. Uh, but it, I think yeah, I would I would stick to my conclusion that uh, green or orange democracies like Taiwan maybe are not as good as we would, we would like they, they are, them to be, but uh, they don't need to become authoritarian regimes to address the uh, dramatic issues of uh, global warming and uh, biodiversity loss, among other important crises, important uh, issues we need to address in terms of environmental protection. Yeah, so I'm just gonna uh, close the the, the YouTube uh, live uh, video. So thank you for uh, all oh, our okay. viewers. Uh, and no, we we're gonna talk among ah. us, but just uh, close the, the the live. Okay. So thank. Y a pas d'autres questions, Annie? No, no. Okay. Okay. So goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>